Oberstein, who's going to be speaking about scaling microservices with Crossbar I.O. So, hello. Yeah, my name is Tobias. I'm giving a talk about scaling microservices, or microservices in general, with Crossbar I.O., but specifically scaling microservices. The talk is online, or the presentation is online. So there will be a lot of links inside, but uh, you don't have to write them down, so just, uh, just open that URL. Um, yeah, well, my name is Tobias. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and various social uh, channels uh, under that nick. Um, that's my email. If you want to give me a, a feedback or have further questions, don't hesitate. Just contact me via email or via Twitter. Um, yeah, my background is in math and statistics. I've been programming since I was 12, which is quite a long ago. I've been doing programming in different languages. Uh, a lot of them I regularly use nowadays C, C++, C++ SQL, JavaScript, the other ones less. And of course, my preferred language is Python these days. So uh, there's one language I still want to learn, that's Rust. Uh, that's missing in my, my repertoire still, because it's an interesting language. But other than that, I'm spending most of the time in Python. So uh, apart from a programmer, I'm founder of Tevendo and Cross.io, a startup. And we do messaging servers. So. Um, and we also uh, vivid open source and community supporter. We, so we started a lot of open source uh, libraries and Cross.io itself is also open source. Uh, regarding the startup, we have a commercial open source business model. So that usual thing, the software, everything is open source. But uh, if you want to have commercial support for Cross.io, you can get that from us. Uh, so that's pretty much standard in yeah, well, enterprise software. You know that business model. Um, well, I mentioned that we uh, started a lot of initiatives, open source libraries. Uh, one of them is Autobahn, you've probably heard of. It was the first WebSocket implementation in Python. Uh, you can use it to write WebSocket clients as well as servers. So you can use it at the pure WebSocket level. Uh, and it also implements the web application messaging protocol, which we will be using for uh, microservices. I will uh, talk about that later. Uh, Autobahn supports uh, two uh, asynchronous networking frameworks under the hood. So that's Twisted and AsyncIO, and runs on Python 2 and 3. And so you can uh, use it like if you're a Twisted guy, then you can use it uh, in a Twisted application, but you can also use it in an async I.O. application. Um, Autobahn is used uh, more and more. Its uh, biggest user probably from the deployment side is uh, Firefox. They use it for active push. So that's uh, a browser feature, a new browser feature, and they have like uh, serving like 80 million connections currently using Autobahn, and want to ramp up that to the whole user base. Uh, that was uh, quite a thrill, uh, having conversations with them, because it's a difference if you have uh, like uh, 1,000 WebSocket connections versus 80 million. There are new effects, <laughs> new, new challenges, like, like keeping them alive and stuff like this. And it also will be a basis for BuildBot 9. That's a continuous integration system also written in Python. Um, then it's used in Django channels. So Django, it's, it's a, uh, based on Whiskey. It's blocking. And they want to have, want to have uh, some more real-time features. So that's, that's also user. Uh, then web application messaging protocol that's also started by us but it's an open ecosystem so it's an open open protocol we're just one implementers nowadays so they are third party implementations of the protocol and the story is like a web socket it's it runs natively over over web socket which is real time bidirectional and stuff like this but it's quite low level. So we figured we needed some, some more abstract for, for writing application. You want something more abstracted. So the one protocol implements uh, remote procedure calls and publish subscribe. We'll, we'll get 
back to that later. Uh, well, yes, uh, crossbar IO, it's a WOMP router, so web application messaging protocol is a router protocol, so you need a router. Uh, there are different routers, crossbar IO is our WOMP router, but they are different uh, WOMP routers, so you're not locked into our stuff. That was because I was mentioning WOMP is an open ecosystem, so we, we, from the beginning, we said, no, we don't want to look in, lock uh, users into our stuff, so you can have different implementations or can use different impl implementations as well. Um, well, there are a lot of links, uh, the presentation. Then we have a, a mini demo code, which is kind of stripped down. That's the second one. And then we have a bigger application that's not quite, we, we've, we've tried to finish it until today, but it's not totally finished, but a lot of code is already working. You can have a look there. It's all on GitHub, so just give it a try. Uh, okay, just very briefly, what's what's microservices? What's the story about that? Uh, I won't go much into detail, but just to to a quick intro. So this is something you don't want to have. What you usually have, if you have a monolith application, you end up with a big pile of spaghetti sooner or later. So it usually starts small and everything is great and works, but in the end, uh, after a couple of months or years, it piles up and in the end it looks like this. So what's the deal? The deal is about taming complexity. So that's the overarching story. Why do you want to have microservices? It's because you want to tame the complexity to not get sunk in, in some spaghetti hell. So that would break down into divide and conquer. So you want to have smaller parts which are more manageable. Uh, one thing should have only one responsibility, so not, not shuffling everything into one, one piece and one piece does everything. So you want to have separation of concerns and then you want to have decoupling. So that's, that's a pretty important point. You have, want to have your, your parts uh, uh, contained and then basically uh, minimize the coupling between the components. So that's the approach to tame complexity. And uh, well, that's of course a longer, uh, uh, has a history, it's not, not new, that, that uh, theme of taming complexity and, sp and, and splitting down stuff uh, is, is pretty old and there were different approaches or different technologies trying to do that, Corba, DCOM, and uh, SOAP is probably the worst of all. Uh, <laughs> well, I've, I've done, for example, C++ with Cobra, which is not nice. So you have to be a masochist to, to, to stand that, basically, or to, to survive that. And in the end, it it's just doesn't work, or it's, it's too complex. So. And we also see why REST and HTTP isn't really an answer, or not at least a complete answer. Uh, for microservices, so if, if you think microservices, most people uh, not send, say, okay, just let's use HTTP REST, that that's works, that's good enough, but we'll see why that isn't enough. Uh, so we will we'll, uh, look at the microservice, how you approach microservices in an application based on an example, and uh, the example is a traveling salesman problem, so we we'll, we we'll look at the traveling salesman problem and the application and how to break that down into microservices and how, what are the challenges and how you would do that. Uh, so just very quickly, the traveling salesman problem, what's, what's that? So imagine a salesman that uh, has to visit a couple of cities. So the big, the fat ring, that's the start point and the, the task for the salesman is to visit all the cities exactly one, or each city exactly once, and then come back to the starting point. So in the, and the, the task is find the route which is shortest. So the salesman wants to travel fast, wants to, uh, uh, wants to uh, minimize the length of the round trip around the cities. <coughs> so, uh, this would be one solution, uh, but not the shortest path. So with that few cities, it's, it's obvious what would be the shortest path, probably this one. And 
Now, the problem is, uh, how do you find that uh, solution uh, computationally and how do you find it if the number of cities uh, is growing? Because the problem is that uh, it grows, the number of possible routes grows pretty fast. It's exponentially, it grows exponentially. So, uh, or, or is 30 cities, cities is already a huge number. I can't even read how many digits. Uh, a lot of digits, so <clears throat> exhaustively uh, uh, looking at each r possible route isn't practically possible. So we need something better. Yeah, well, that's uh, just just the wrap up. So the traveling salesman problem is a combinatorial optimization problem, and the search p space looking for a solution that's exponentially large. And there isn't a deterministic or a, a, a close solution to that problem. So there are problems, uh, it's a close solution, but traveling salesman is not a, one of them. So we'll look at uh, one way to solve that, just very briefly, that's simulated annealing. So if you have a search space now in one dimension, that's the x, x axis, and you have a coast function uh, that, that gives the coast depending on the uh, the particular solution in the search space, you're looking basically looking at an energy surface or cost surface. And the, the problem is that you don't want to get stuck in, if you, if you now try, for example, gradient descent, uh, you pretty much get stuck in a local minimum. And simulated annealing tries to avoid that by, uh, uh, by a clever clever heuristic to, to look uh, inside the search space and search for the best solution. So it isn't, isn't uh, um, try to avoid that getting stuck in a local minimum. And how do you do that? So we don't need to understand the, the details of the algorithm, but there is an important point where there's a repeat m times loop. And that's the important point because we use that to, to scale out the microservice. So we will have a com compute microservice component and, uh, and we want to scale that out. And to be able to do that, we need to have in the algorithm a, a place where we can split up the problem into sub-problems and then distribute to each instance of the compute, compute microservice part of the, the problem. So. If you're interested, it works like you start with the uh, initial temperature and uh, annealing. That's uh, the, the idea is like if you if you have a melted melted material and cool it down, it will it will uh, if you if you cool it down slowly, it will get into the minimum energy state. So and that's just uh, a transfer of that idea into an algorithm. Um, and so you should start with initial temperature and the initial state, which can be any, just a random route. And then you repeat that until you, you've reached a lower end temperature. And then you, you just have, starting from your current solution, you perturbate that solution a little bit, just like swap two cities, the, the order in which they are visited, swap those. And then have a look again at the modified route. Is the energy, is the cost lower? If it's lower, then you take the new route. And if it's higher, you nevertheless take the new route, even if the cost is higher, with a certain probability that depends on the temperature. And that's the trick, because that avoids to get er stuck into a local minimum early, early in, uh, 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 while, while running. So there's, uh, there's always a little bit. Uh, uh, Unless the temperature is zero, there's always a, a non-zero probability of taking a, a, a worse route. So that gets you out of the local minima. <clears throat> but that's not, it's, it's just an example. The important point is that we have a repeat m times part in the algorithm, which we can use to, to distribute to our multiple instances of the compute service. Uh, well, that's, why don't we run it on one core just and that's enough because uh, the answer is, uh, is simple because there are no, you, uh, there's a limit based in or rooted in physics. You, we don't just don't have like, like infinite fast single core machines. So we have to use multiple cores. Uh, 
how would we use multiple cores for that problem in an application solving traveling salesman? Uh, we could use some ad hoc mechanisms. This is not what we'll talking or what I will be talking about, because that's ad hoc mechanisms just for the compute problem. I'll be talking about just using microservices also for the compute part, also for scaling the compute part. And uh, well, now TSP app, how does does it look? Uh, we, ha we have an application that the input is the problem, uh, our compute time budget, and we just want to have uh, the, uh, as an output the best route found in that uh, compute time budget. Uh, so the app has to do basically three things. So it needs to control the overall search, the orchestration of the search. It has to have an, uh, a user interface. We want to be able to look at the route or control the parameters. And it needs the compute core, multiple instances of the compute core. So splitting up that into a microservice application would probably look like this. So we have uh, now split up the monolith, the big monolith, in different, in different parts. And uh, the different parts, uh, we have uh, user interface, microservice parts, we have compute parts, and we have the orchestrator. So uh, this is the TSP app from a microservice angle or in the microservice split down uh, architecture. Now the thing is, these components need to talk to each other. So for example, the orchestrator that controls the overall optimization needs to uh, needs to call into the compute instance, instances of the mi compute microservice uh, for subparts of the search space. Compute me your best route within your subspace of search. And then it wants to get back the result, best route for that subproblem or subspace of the search uh, space. So it need, we need something to call into the com from the orchestrated microservice to call into the compute service and get back a result. So that's pretty straightforward. But we also want to have something like events. Like the compute servers, what's my current load on the, on the machine running that instance of the compute microservice? Uh, it probably needs, one, we want to see what's the CPU load, currently how many routes per second are, are processed by that particular instance of the compute microservice. So we need something, something different, which is uh, event uh, we want to distribute information to the other part. So the orchestrator wants probably to track all the, the CPU loads of the instances of the micro compute microservice, and we want to show that in the, in the user interface as well. <clears throat> so we need two patterns, remote procedure call and publish subscribe. Ideally in one protocol and one technology that makes it easier, and that's, uh, that's one way is using the web application messaging protocol because we figured initially that we, we want to have something more abstract than, than raw web socket and we need those two uh, messaging patterns in one protocol. Um, so how does it work? Uh, we have app components, components of microservice I will use it synonymously uh, and those are initially connecting to Crossbar. Crossbar is a router, one router. So code-wise, it looks like this. This is the twisted variant. Uh, how do you establish sessions uh, from the components, from the microservices to Crossbar? Uh, I won't go much into detail, but in the end, you get a session object, which is self, and then you can have those actions for the two messaging patterns for uh, remote procedure calls and for publish subscribe for publishing uh, and, uh, and receiving events. So that's just kind of boilerplate, which you need to establish a session, and then to actually run a session, you have this boilerplate. I will not go into details, but you can see there's a WS in, in the application run in that URL. That means it runs over WebSocket. Okay, so pattern number one, publish, subscribe. Idea is you have an abstract namespace, URIs, uh, which uh, uh, with names where the names are topics. 
So the uh, decoupling between the publisher and the subscriber side is via that namespace, via that URIs. Uh, the publisher publishes to the abstract topic, crossbar knows, or the one prudent knows who is subscribed on that topic and can distribute the, uh, <coughs> the events again. So uh, two app components uh, could subscribe, like the UI, uh, subscribe to C on CPU load change, uh, or the backend, the orchestrator on CPU load change, uh, and then uh, the compute component can publish when the CPU load changes, or each second, for example, periodically publish my CPU load, and the subscribers would then receive the CPU load. And the, the point is both don't need to know about each other. So we have that decoupling. So the publisher side doesn't need to know where who's subscribed, where are my subscribers, where are they currently residing. They could be behind network, be behind netted networks and behind firewalls and so on. So we have that decoupling for that pattern. Oh, okay, missed that. That's the distribution of the event then uh, to the actual subscribers. So code-wise, it looks like this, pretty easy. You have a call, uh, uh, event handler on hello. Uh, that should be fired when you receive an event on your subscription. And to subscribe, you just say session subscribe. You say, what's my event handler and your URI. So that's pretty straightforward. A subscription can fail basically only for, for one reason, that's you're not allowed to subscribe. So there, there are authorization mechanisms in Crossbar where you can finally control who is allowed, which role is allowed to subscribe, who is allowed to publish or not. Um, yeah, well, publish looks like this. So you have uh, 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 basically also on the session of that session published, so you can publish your data. Um, so how do uh, remote procedure call look? look? Uh, this is also, again, decoupled with a namespace. Your eyes are decoupling the caller and callee side. So a callee says, I provide a, for a procedure, and this is callable under this URI. And then the caller can call the procedure under the URI, but both don't need to know where physically the other one resides. So we, again, have a decoupling. So this looks, again, like this. The uh, component registers. Uh, when then there's a call incoming, Crossbar knows who has registered the, the procedure and can forward the call to the callee. The callee produces a result, and the result is then shuffled back to the original caller. So again, we have a decoupling between caller and callee, which is pretty much a difference to REST HTTP. Because with REST HTTP, the caller needs to know where is the host name and the port number which I'm trying to call. So there you have a coupling to your deployment infrastructure, and you have a coupling in from your application code to your deployment infrastructure, and you don't want to have that. So we transferred that pattern from publish subscribe, the decoupling to the, to the remote procedure call. Uh, well, register looks like this. Need to fasten up a little bit, I think. Uh, just code-wise, you can have a look on the presentations online. Call can be done like this, so it's pretty pretty straightforward. Session, call, and you have the, the only difference basically to a direct function called the yield there, which, which uh, you should recognize that's asynchronous code. So it's not a synchronous in-process call, but it's out of process. It's does network stuff, but it's asynchronous. Therefore, the yield you could have in your in Python 3.5, you could have a wait, basically. So that's just uh, that's Python 2 compatible code, but in Python 3.5, there would be a, a wait at that place. And you can, of course, combine those actions. So you can call a procedure in an event handler and then publish events from a registered procedure if it's called and stuff like this. So it's all pretty much you can combine that to, to create more complex interactions. 
than shared registration. That's the feature which we, will, which we will be using for scaling out market services. If we have two, normally one uh, uh, procedure can only be registered once. Uh, the second one gets an error, already registered. But in Crossbow we have a feature called shared registration which allows the same procedure to be registered by multiple instances of a service or, or instance uh, of a component. And how does it work? Then if there's, or how is it usable? It's usable because Crossbar then can, for example, implement hot standby for you. So you can have all the calls routed to the main primary component until that component fails and then all further calls are transparently routed to the hot standby component. And the caller doesn't need, doesn't, uh, uh, isn't aware of that. So it's totally transparent. So you have hot failover for microservices, like that's one use. And the other one for, for the problem here is this uh, scale out. So you can have calls routed to different components or multiple instances of the component in a round robin fashion. So that allows you to, to scale because you can run those instances on different machines and it's again transparent, completely transparent for the caller side. The caller side doesn't need, isn't, even, isn't even aware of the fact that there are multiple instances on the callee side, it's just transparent. So shared registrations, that isn't, it's not complex at all, it's just a single option that you have to, uh, to give on the register with, uh, if, when you're registering the, the procedure, it's invoke round robin. So we have different invocation policies. Round robin is one. Random, like single first, last, or different invocation policies will be using round robin. It's, it's simple, straightforward to understand. Um, so then there's another feature because if you, if you then say, okay, that's enough, normally, uh, a component can take in an uh, arbitrary amount of calls. Like if you have a Python component, that's, it's a single thread. Uh, it doesn't make sense to, to send it like 100 calls if it's only single threaded. If you, if you make it multi-threaded or if you have a component which is multi-threaded, then it can probably take in m many calls in parallel. But uh, that's, you should be able to control that concurrency, otherwise your component just gets overwhelmed by incoming calls or invocations. So that's uh, another feature which is pretty much necessary for, for practical use. It's max concurrency. You can register, uh, a callee can register and give max concurrency, say I'm able to do that many concurrent calls, to process that many concurrent calls. Um, so again, that's pretty easy. It's another option during the register. You just give the concurrency you're able to, to, to serve and Crossbow will, will note that and then it will not ever send more than that many calls concurrently to your component. So that way you can prohibit being, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm too slow, sorry. Okay, uh, TCP app. So this is the architecture it looks like then. Uh, so we all connect the crossbar. <clears throat> of course, you can have those components uh, written in different languages. Uh, so we support more than 12 languages. And, <clears throat> and then you can combine those components or place the components on different boxes, machines, physical machines. So you can have the orchestrator, the computer machine one, to different compute instances of the next, uh, next machine and so on. <clears throat> Summary, yes, uh, microservices, new, new answer, old problem. Uh, we've seen that Corbra and everything else, but we think that's, that's a new, uh, new answer to the old problem, a better answer than before. <clears throat> Uh, we have uh, seen those two connection patterns uh, or interaction patterns, remote procedure called publish, subscribe, which we think are pretty much always necessary or most often necessary in practical applications. And then we've seen how that is made easy by Crossbahn Autobahn. Uh, scaling and hot standby are offered by the router, in particular by Crossbio. There isn't currently, the, the WAMP routers differ by feature sets. Crossbar is the most advanced one, so not every WOMP router, or currently it's the only one that supports that. Yeah, we'll also have a, a price draw uh, with two. Uh, looks 
like this. Uh, IoT starter kits, we are pretty much into the Internet of Things. We've got two of these. You can win these. Uh, if you take the survey, you don't have to provide your email. We don't want to have your personal data, just feedback. So uh, please visit these links. Take, take part in the survey, and you can win two of these. Okay, that's, that's my talk. So, any questions? Yeah. Yes, so Crossbar IO is like a black box that handles everything, or do you deploy it yourself? And if you deploy it yourself, you know, does it have like a few nodes, does it you know, do high availability if one node fails? And you, 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 can, you can deploy it on your own premises, so it's open source, you can, it's open source, you can just download it, deploy it in your bare metal on your, in your cloud on AWS. We also have Docker support, so you can just Docker run crossbar basically, and you're, you're up and running, but it's right, it's a black box as is, it should be looked at as a black box. You can also install it like pip install crossbar, but you should look at it like, like Apache or Nginx, like a black box system. So we, we, are, we are still working on that, on the, on the scale out part of, cross, of the routing core itself, so that, that is in the, wor on, and we're working on that. That's probably I can tell after that more. Uh, okay, so thank you for your talk. Uh, how do we manage to use um, database with a crossbar? I mean, we have to, uh, we need database interaction. So does it have to be in synchronous too? Uh, well, you can have the database interaction in from your components. So you can have a component which is just using SQL Alchemy to talk to your database or whatever. We will also have it, this upcoming thing, which is a Postgres SQL connector, which will allow you to directly use WOMP right into the database. So you can, for example, call a, a Postgres SQL stored procedure like any other WOMP, stored, uh, WOMP procedure. So you can call from JavaScript directly into a stored procedure in Postgres SQL, or you can publish events, WOMP events, from a trigger in Postgres SQL. Okay, so it doesn't have to be asynchronous on your uh, in your component, you can be you could you could create a component and let it be synchronous, right? Uh, if you if you're mentioning like like database uh, libraries are usually synchronous, uh, there there are ways to to work around that. So Postgres, SQL, for example, has also asynchronous, real asynchronous database drivers. Others like if you have an Oracle, CX Oracle, it is synchronous, but you can run it. You have to run it then on the background thread. So otherwise, it blocks your primary thread, with, which is doing the asynchronous uh, networking. So, but there's there are ways to to handle that. So that's. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, for talk, um, my question is: the, your scenario is uh, real nice because it's very easy just talking between microservices. But uh, I'm afraid to use these products because when I need to make authorization, let's say uh, uh, my clients uh, need to get some of the data, uh, it's, it's scary because how do I pass my tokens from the user to the, uh, to the let's say, uh, Autobahn or Crossbar, or when I pass them, let's say my authorization change. And these problems are... Yeah. Well, well, there are the probably different aspects. We have authentication mechanisms built into Crossbar. We also have extensions for extension points in Crossbar where you can hook into the authentication uh, phase uh, uh, pretty much by just implementing a WOMP component again, which is then called during the authentication. So you can plug into a proprietary authentication system and then we have role-based authorization, which means you can finally control which, who, is allowed, who is allowed to subscribe, who is allowed to publish. For example, the one, the sensor in an IoT application could be allowed to publish, but not to subscribe even to its own topic. Uh, so you can have finely controlled um, um, yeah, well, authorization of those actions. 
Uh, but but that, there, there are many aspects, like you mentioned in, uh, like uh, encryption or security, or in, in what direction is here? Um, and a uh, uh, nice example is a, a user can see uh, different uh, instances. There is instances. So one user can see only two instances, and I have a topic named instances in the crossbar, let's mm -hmm. say. So uh, how do I uh, send a, a user only is instances? Yeah, you can you can either have uh, the the uh, a role based authorization mechanism where the specific user is authenticated under a specific role and only under that role he is able to receive his own events or the events he should be able to receive, and you also can have uh, that's called exclude and eligible. You can have, but that's an advanced feature now. Probably we'll talk after that. You, you can control even for the individual publication down to the session level who is uh, who should receive that event. So not all the subscribers which are basically authorized and subscribed, but even a subset you can you can have uh, exclude and eligible. But let's let's talk. Let's probably to to show that <laughs> code. But you can. Pretty much, finally, control who is allowed to do what and who is a, who should get what event or whatever. So that there's a lot of stuff inside. So we are pretty much paranoid on the security side. So that's <laughs> maybe also an answer. Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, one question you mentioned, like the routing you do. Um, the main feature is the decoupling. Um, I see that, but it also seems to me now that you introduced a very tight coupling to crossbar to like a third component, and solving that in the like HTTP case would involve something like you can use a load balancer or something like smart stack. Um, so, like, how would you respond to that? Do you think it's this is more of a convenience that it's easier to set up and get everything running, or? Do you have a different point of view? I have a different point of view because at the application level, crossbar is invisible. From your code, it's, it's, it's only visible in the initial connection establishment. But, but that's a couple of lines of boilerplate somewhere in your application. The rest, or in your microservice, the rest of your microservice code is totally unaware of the fact that there's an intermediary. So, and regarding your point with the HTTP REST doing load balancing, then you're pretty much reinventing what we did. Because then the, the load balancer needs to know who, where are my REST endpoints, and when they change, when the one machine goes down, it needs to be updated, the, the load balancer needs to be, so there's a whole category of, of startups, a, the API management for microservice, for REST-based uh, microservices. So that's a whole category which, from our point of view, is, is doing it the wrong way. <laughs> but of course, that's, that's our view. Uh, but I think you're, you're starting down the road reinventing the stuff we do. That, that, that decoupling will be based on your load balance, on your Nginx or whatever, but then you have to, to manage that. That needs to know where are my REST endpoints. And, and the other problem is, uh, we've not talked about that, but it's all open ports. All your microservices are basically web servers with open ports. So you have a pretty much big attack surface. With Crossbar, you only have outgoing connections from the components from the microservice. There are no listening ports. So for example, that's not only a problem on the security side, it's only also a problem on the networking side. If your microservice is behind a net, it's not reachable from outside. So REST doesn't work. So you can shoot should, should uh, uh, open ports, uh, UPnP or whatever, but that's security hell and, and uh, so, but with Crossbar you can have your app component, your microservice sitting behind the net, doesn't matter because it's only one outgoing connection. So there's advantage on security on network side, yeah. Just, uh, would you normally deploy it behind Nginx or is it the first thing you'd hit, Crossbar? Please, I didn't. Would you normally deploy, deploy crossbar behind Nginx? You can, of course. Mo many people do that. Be deploy that behind Nginx for, for basically serving static web assets from Nginx from the caching and then just uh, reverse proxying the WebSocket connections to crossbar. But 
I would say we personally, we ourselves, we just run plain crossbar. So there's a web server built in. We've done benchmarking like it, it scales on 40 cores to 600,000 web requests per second, can shuffle more than 10 gig per second uh, HTTP response traffic. So we don't have a need for Nginx. If you like Facebook, then probably yes, <laughs> and you need Nginx. But so Nginx will be faster on the pure serving static web assets, but for our use cases, you don't need it pretty much. What's that? What's that? Hi. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I saw on your website, uh, I'm here. Uh, I saw on your, on your website an IoT link, which uh, is, it seems not to work now. Uh, but uh, you have a lot uh, of projects with um, crossbar in uh, an embedded environment or something like, like this. Uh, well, well uh, the, the Internet of Things, uh, Industry 4.0, it's the most important user base or users for, for us because it's a big wave coming. And uh, there you have inherently distributed applications. If, if you're writing like, like a holiday planner, you can still decide if it's a monolith or it's a, if it's a microservice app because in the end it will run in the data center and only there. But if you have an in, uh, Internet of Things application with different locations, moving vehicles, uh, uh, data center backends, mobile devices, and whatever, then that's inherently already distributed. So there isn't a choice between monolith and microservices or because it's inherently turned, uh, distributed already. Uh, and uh, while we have a, a lot of feedback or uptake in, in the Internet of Things, so we users uh, of Crossbar are either uh, uh, doing it for like, I want to make my web user interface real time. That's one user. Uh, the other one says, okay, I have, I run a Bitcoin exchange, want to have some real time stuff, but the, the, the biggest or most interest from, for, from our point of view is Internet of Things. So that's, that's pretty much a focus for us. But yeah. Okay, I see there's still people with questions left. I would invite you to go afterwards during lunch or right now or whenever. Go grab this guy and ask your questions and we're gonna to get to the next speaker. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you.